So this is a joint work with Protoy Agbar, Gilles Duranton, and Adam Storygard. And in some sense, this is preliminary work. So we haven't written an academic paper yet with this material that I will present today. But our team has been working for a few years on how to use Google Maps and other big data sources to measure the performance of transportation system in cities. So today I'll talk about some new big data sor sources that have recently become available to study urban transportation. And I will show you some new facts about urban travel and cities around the world that we learn from that data. So in terms of motivation for the project, traffic congestion and travel speed is a major policy concern in almost every large city. So it's hard to find a city where traffic congestion isn't a common complaint or a policy issue. And more generally, we lack evidence on what causes slow travel speed and on what kind of policies can improve mobility outcome. And our team really believes that the lack of useful data set is an important reason why basic questions about urban transportation are so hard to answer. Uh, but in recent years, with technology firms like Google, they have been collecting an enormous amount of data on urban mobility, thanks to the GPS in our mobile phones. And this kind of GPS data provides great new opportunities for characterizing urban traffic patterns. So this is what we do um, in this project. So for this project, we use Google Maps mostly to collect information on approximately 1 billion trips in 1,200 cities on five different continents. We produce index of travel speed congestion and accessibility in each of these cities. And we use these indices to investigate the determinants of urban travel speed. So we ask, what are the characteristics of slow cities? What are the characteristics of fast cities? What are the determinants of travel speed in cities? In particular, we'll be asking, is congestion, is traffic congestion important in explaining why some cities are slow and why some cities are fast? And another key contribution of that project and of the research agenda that I'm presenting today is that we will be able to provide a global open database on urban transportation that other researchers can use. Uh, and for instance, we're working right now with the World Bank to make that happen and publicize this data that we've been putting together. So why is research like this important? Well, first we care about travel speed because we care about accessibility. So in other words, speed determines how long it takes to travel to meet people or to go to places. And these meetings are really what makes cities vibrant and productive. And that's why cities are so important for our social, cultural, and economic lives. The second reason we think a project like that is important, it, there is almost no data on urban transportation in poor countries. So poor countries generally lack a household travel survey, like the National Household Travel Survey in the United States. So there is uh, very little data on urban travel in poor countries. So, even the National Household Travel Survey in the United States happens only every seven years, and it costs tens of millions of dollars. So here we want to show that we can collect useful data at a fraction of the cost of these travel surveys and much more frequently. And finally, understanding the determinants of travel speed has important policy implication. For instance, if we find that congestion is not an important determinant of travel speed, so if the city is slow, even in the middle of the night when there's no traffic, then congestion fighting policies like high occupancy vehicle lanes or congestion pricing, these policies that are the standard toolkit to improve traffic, well, they're unlikely to be effective. Um, so now here is a preview 
of the results of the work that I will show you today. So first we find that Google Maps does a very good job at capturing traffic variation and it offers high quality data in a large majority of, of world cities. Second, we find that traffic congestion turns out not to be an important determinant of speed variation within and across countries. Having good road infrastructure that offer fast travel all the time is much more important. I'll return to that result like with pictures and, and explanations throughout the paper. Our third result is we find that the GDP of a country, so how rich that country is, that explains most of the speed variation across cities that we observe. So richer countries have better road infrastructure and therefore much faster travel speed. So we also find, that perhaps unsurprisingly, that denser, larger cities are slower and road networks that conform to a grid patterns and that have more major roads are faster. And finally, our last result is that faster speed in richer countries translates into better accessibility in richer countries, so into shorter travel time to go places and meet people. Um, so let me first describe some of the data in words, and then I'll show you some picture, some pictures to visualize things. Um, so here is how we define our sample of cities. So we start with a sample of all cities that have a population above 300,000 in 2018. So that's 1,860 cities. Then we define the boundary of each of these cities using the global human settlement uh, layer, the version that defines each one kilometer grid cell as urban uh, or not. After splitting and merging small cities, there's 1,807 cities that remain. And immediately we have to drop every city in China or in South Korea from our sample of cities because Google map is blocked in these countries. So there's 1,358 cities that, that remain. So that's one first data challenge that we were facing. How do we define cities everywhere in the world using a consistent methodology? And this is how, how we did it. The second challenge is to sample some trips in all of these cities. So we obtain real-time traffic information on 900 million motor vehicle trips from Google Map. Uh, for each origin and destination pair, so for each trip, we collect 30 different instances of that trip at different times of the day or different days of the week. And Google will report the distance and travel time on the recommended route for each of these trips. So we collect that data. And importantly, Google also reports the time that a trip would take if there wasn't any traffic. So, another way to measure the time a trip would take if there wasn't traffic is just to take the time for that trip in the middle of the night, where we know that at night there is no traffic. Another challenge here is to obtain a representative sample of trips. What are plausible origin and destinations for the trips that we collect? And our approach here is to design many different samples of trips that resemble the actual trips that people take along some dimensions. And we show that we get similar results using these different samples. So two examples of the kind of trips that we collect are radial trips that resemble a standard commute from the suburb to the city center, or trips to amenities like restaurants or hospitals that we find on Google Places. So here are pictures of those trips, those trips in Lagos, the capital of, of uh, Nigeria. So on the left, you can see radial trips from the suburbs of Lagos to the city center there. And on the right, we show trips that are entirely different and that run circles around the, the center of the city. Um, again, we don't know exactly the trips that people take. So our approach is to collect many different kinds of trips 
and show that our results are similar regardless of how we define trips. Here, now I'm showing you trips to work uh, and trips to school in Lagos. Uh, trips to work or trips to location that are identified as corporate offices on, on Google Places. So the next data that we collect is on establishments. We'll use the trip level data to study travel speed, but to study accessibility to different types of places, we also collected data on the exact location of 24 million establishments from Google Places. So to collect these establishments, we search Google Place, like you would do on Google Map, using 109 keywords like restaurants or police stations. And every keyword, keyword search would return 20 establishments. And we search different areas of the city like that until every keyword stopped returning new establishments. So here I'm showing you the 64,000 establishments that we have in Lagos, Nigeria, uh, with different categories of establishment in different colors. So restaurant in purple, malls in green, schools in red, and so on. The hole in the middle there is there's an airport and a park in the middle of the city. And the other areas with no establishments are forested. So if I show you a satellite picture here, you can clearly show like the boundary of the city that we have. And here, this is another city, Eco Udu, uh, that's the next suburb of Lagos that we have also in, in our center. So we have other data source for this project. For instance, we have data on the location and class of roads in each city from OpenStreetMaps. OpenStreetMaps is the kind of Wikipedia for geographic data. So it's a collaborative project where everyone can contribute information on the location and class of roads or on the location of geographic features like rivers uh, all around the world. Um, so we have, uh, oh, sorry. So we have also data on population from the World Bank, on income from the United Nation, um, sorry, population from the United Nation and income from the World Bank, and many other data sources for this project that I won't describe in detail, but I want to show you at least some open street map data. So here, the two cities that I'm showing you are interesting because they are the most and least gritty in the world. So a city is gritty if all its roads are orientated, oriented in the same direction with intersections at right angles. So you can see on the left here that Ciudad Obregón in Mexico is very gritty and Charleroi in Belgium is not gritty at all. Uh, so with roads that twist and turn in, in all directions. So a lot of cities in the United States have networks that are very gritty, um, like all parallel avenues and streets that are exactly uh, perpendicular. So it's not a coincidence that a North American city is the most gritty and an old European city, it's, it's the least gritty. And some urban planners and economists claim that the greediness of an urban network is an important determinant of faster travel. So here we will have a chance to test those theories with that data. So one obvious concern in this project is that maybe Google Maps doesn't have high quality data in some cities. So it's important to test the quality of this new data that we collect. Um, Google map data on travel speed, it comes from phones, smartphones that use the Android operating system or that use other apps like if you use Google Maps, for instance. So there were 2.5 billion Android phones back when we collected this data in the spring of 2019. So arguably, every traffic jam on the planet likely has at least one Android phone in there. To, to measure speed. Uh, but we still worry that in small and poor cities that have may have 
fewer smartphones or may receive less attention from, from Google. So the first thing we did is we compared our Google Maps speed data with data on speed from actual trips in India and in the United States, and we found very similar speeds. So this is reassuring that Google Maps has high quality data in most cities in the world, but we are still concerned that maybe in smaller African uh, cities, data quality could be lower. And let me show you how we try to identify cities with lower data quality. Um, so we have three criteria, uh, criteria, sorry, to drop cities where we're not confident we have good data. So first we remove all countries where Google itself tells us it doesn't have good data. So that's 18 mostly small countries that account for 51 cities. So we lose Sudan, Yemen, North Korea, Syria, Somalia. Somalia. Um, second, um, well, what do we mean by good data, right? So our seven criteria uh, tries to capture that. So if you've ever used Google Map, you know that Google has real-time traffic data, so the road color changes. So blue or green means traffic is free-flowing, red is heavily congested. And when there's no color, presumably there aren't enough phones on that particular road for Google to tell the speed. So we color code these images, like here for Anaba in Algeria, um, all the roads are yellow or white. And then when we ask for real-time traffic, um, are the roads become like green or orange and red. And our measure of data quality is the share of roads that are green or orange or red. Uh, so the share of roads where we think Google has real-time traffic data in that city. Um, so we pick a fairly arbitrary cutoff where we keep only cities that have at least 5% of colored pixels uh, in our sample. So this drops 61 cities. And again, they're mostly small cities um, in Africa. Uh, in the third step of our data cleaning procedure, we eliminate cities where there is little variation in travel speed across different instances of our trips, because there we worry that Google Map may not have real-time traffic data. So that drops 19 more cities. So in the final sample of cities that I'm showing you results for today, we have 92% of the urban population uh, in cities with population over 300 outside of, of China. That's not in our data. Um, OK, so now let me show you some raw data that shows some patterns that I will cover in more detail later. So here, these plots, they show average speed throughout the day for a few cities. So you have here on the y-axis, you have speed in kilometers per hour. And here on the x-axis, you have the hour of the day starting zero is midnight. Um, midnight, 2 a.m., 10 a.m., uh, right now, 6.30 p.m. here. So I'm showing you the fastest city in the world here, which is Flint, Michigan. The most congested city in the world, which is Bogota in Colombia. And you can see how congested Bogota is, right? It has, Bogota has fairly a high speed during the night. Uh, and then there's a big drop in speed through almost the entire daytime. And then it goes back up uh, in the evening. Uh, still further below, you have the slowest city in the world. That's Dhaka in Bangladesh. Uh, and even further below, I'm showing you only the trips that pass through central Dhaka, the center of Dhaka, that are even slower. So in terms of patterns, we see huge differences in speed from about 50 kilometers per hour to about 15, one five kilometer per hour from a rich country like the United States to a middle income countries like Colombia and to a poor country like Bangladesh. A second pattern that we see in that figure is that congestion may not be the main determinant 
of the speed differences across cities and countries, right? So Bogota is the most congested city in the world, but it's still faster than Dhaka. Um, here, that figure shows you how congested these cities are. So I'm showing you the percentage change in travel time relative to middle of the night. So middle of the night is here. That's the percentage decrease from middle of the night, uh, midnight here. Um, so you see that Bogota in Colombia, which is the lower curve here, is just remarkably congested, right? Speeds are about 50% faster than in the middle of the night from 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So in Bogota, the whole city for the entire workday is more congested than even central Dhaka at the worst time of the day. Okay, um, so now we want to compute a speed index in each city. So we want to compute one number that tells us how slow or fast a given city is. And that's useful because that number would be comparable across cities. So it will allow us to compare cities in a simple way. It's challenging because our sample, like any trip sample, varies systematically across cities along dimensions that affect travel speed. So for instance, in larger cities, we sample longer trips and we know longer trips are faster. So to solve that problem, we use what's called a price index methodology. So it's the same kind of methodology that people use to measure inflation. So you compare the price of a comparable basket of consumer goods over time. So our methodology here assume that each trip is like a good, speed is the price of that good, and we want to create a comparable basket of trips in each city to get an index of speed that's comparable across cities. So how do we do this? I think that's the most technical part of the, of the talk here. So but I'll just describe briefly. Um, the simplest way to compute a speed index is from a regression analysis that I'm showing here. So in that regression, we relate trip speed here to controls like trip length that again, make our basket of trip comparable across cities. And we have a city effect uh, for each city that is our speed index. So you can think of the city effect, that's our speed index here, as an average speed in that city, controlling for trip characteristics that vary across cities. So in other words, that procedure gets us a speed index that's like an average speed in each city computing, computed using a similar basket of trips in each city. So we compute two other indices uh, in a similar way. So first we compute an index of uncongested speed. So that's speed with, without traffic. And we interpret uncongested speed as a measure of infrastructure quality. So it's essentially how fast your roads are in the absence of traffic. So I refer often to uncongested speed. It's just the speed that a trip would have without any traffic, if there wasn't any other cars on the road to slow you down. Second, we compute an index of congestion. And congestion is just the difference between actual speed and uncongested speed. So congestion captures how much slower travel is due to having traffic, other cars on the road. So now let me show you some uh, word city ranking. So here I'm showing you the 20 cities with the fastest uncongested speed. So this is a measure of speed without traffic that captures something like infrastructure quality. So the cities with the best infrastructure are basically all smaller cities in the United States. With a, as a Canadian, a honorable mention to Windsor uh, Canada in 20th position. That's Windsor is right across Detroit. Um, and the cities that have the worst infrastructure are all in poorer countries. So the cities with the worst infrastructure, so the slowest uncongested speed is Dhaka in Bangladesh. 
Um, so to interpret these numbers, uncongested speed is 43% faster in Flint than in the average city in the world and 51% slower in Dhaka than in the average city in the world. So that's a more than threefold difference in speed uh, in uncongested speed, sorry, across cities, which is really large. Now I'm showing you the most and least congested cities. Um, so you have, again, Bogota is the most congested city in the world in Colombia, but you also have Paris, London, New York, um, here towards the bottom of the top 20. Um, so the most congested cities are not the poorest or the richest cities. The most congested cities are just very large cities. Um, among the least congested cities, you generally have smaller, poor cities that have little economic activity. Um, so you have some countries like Nigeria and India that have cities that both in the least and most congested group. So that suggests that perhaps characteristics of countries may be less important in explaining congestion. Uh, in terms of how to interpret these coefficients, so the number, the index is equal to 0.19 here. It says that in Bogota, travel delay, so the difference between speed with and without traffic, travel delay is 19% larger in Bogota than in the average city. And if you look at the least congested city, Chimoyo in Mozambique, it's 13% less congested than the average word city. Um, so now putting this together, putting uncongested speed and congestion together, we can look at the overall speed ranking. So you have here the fastest cities in the world, and you see mostly the same cities that had the best infrastructure with some perturbations. So for instance, you have a city in Saudi Arabia here showing up. Uh, that has like really fast roads and almost no congestion. So it's moving up uh, the ranking. Looking now at the slowest cities in the world, that ranking resembles that of the slowest uncongested speed in the world. But you also see that the large cities that are highly congested are moving up the ranking. So you have Dhaka in Bangladesh, Lagos in Nigeria, Manila in the Philippines, uh, Kinshasa, Kolkata are all uh, large and congested cities. So congestion does matter in explaining why some very large cities are slow. And Dhaka really stands out, as does the rest of Bangladesh, as both having slow traffic and being fairly congested. So overall, the slowest cities in the world are either large and poor or small and very poor. Um, so here is a New York Times uh, advice from the travel section. It's about traffic in Dhaka. It tells us that of all the dysfunctions that plague the world's mega cities, none may be more pernicious than bad, really, really bad traffic. Sitting still in Dhaka, where bad design takes on epic proportions. So that language is, is a bit unclear technically, but it does mention bad design, which seems to acknowledge that slow traffic is more than just a congestion problem. So let me summarize what we've learned from these tables. So the US, uh, the United States completely dominates the ranking of the fastest cities in the world. So we have 139 cities in our sample and 91 of the 100 with the best roads and 87 of the cities with the fastest speed are in the United States. There's no other cities that really compete with the US in terms of providing fast travel uh, by private vehicles. Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates come closest than Canada, New Zealand, Australia. Uh, we know that the current US administration has a massive infrastructure plan. So it's interesting to know that despite all the talks that the road infrastructure in the, U in the US is crumbling and there's a lack of investment, well, the United States already performs much better than anywhere else uh, in the world. So the figure and rankings that I've showed you so far, they suggest that 
uh, most of the speed variation across cities comes from uncongested speed, so infrastructure, not from congestion. So slow cities, they're slow all the time. Slow cities are slow even at night when there's no traffic congestion. This means that in many contexts, investment in infrastructure could have more impact than standard congestion fighting policies. So in a city like, say, Dhaka in Bangladesh, travel is slow all the time, even when there's no traffic. So the effectiveness of congestion fighting policies could be limited. And finally, looking at these rankings, it looks like country income is important. Uh, so how rich a country is is an important determinant of speed. So in the next few slides, I'll show you correlation of the GDP of a country with the average speed index for, for that country. Um, so here on the x-axis, you have the GDP of a country. And on the y-axis, you have uncongested speed in that country, which we take as a measure of infrastructure. And that's an impressively tight relationship here. Uh, so you have countries like the Congo and Bangladesh, Afghanistan, Ethiopia, Mozambique, with, that are very poor and have the slowest roads. And you have the United States, United Arab Emirates, Australia, Canada, Saudi Arabia that have the fastest roads. Next, I'm showing you again GDP per capita versus average congestion. And here I added a quadratic term because it looks like middle income countries like Romania, Colombia, Costa Rica, Poland have more congestion than very poor or very rich countries. But it's not a tight fit. So country GDP is much worse at predicting congestion than at predicting road quality. And finally, putting this together to correlate GDP with speed, we find that they're also tightly related because GDP predicts uncongested speed, so road quality, which is the main determinant of overall speed. Um, so now again, I'm showing you, so this is like I guess the second, a bit technical part of the talk. I'm showing you another regression analysis. Uh, so an investigation of the determinant of travel speed at the city level. So each column presents a different regression. So for instance, the first column relates travel speed. So travel speed to population and area, to city population and area. So the coefficient of minus 0.13 here tells us that if you double the population of the city, then speed decreases by 13%. The R square here tells us how much of the variation just these two variables <clears throat> explain. So just population and area explains 17% of the speed variation across cities. Um, so again, so column one shows that population and area are important determinants of travel speed. So large and dense cities are slower. Then in column two, we add the GDP of the country to that regression. And we find that richer countries have much faster speed. And with just these three variables, population, area, and country GDP, we explain most 55% of the variation in speed across cities. In column three, we add more explanatory variables. And we find that cities that have more major roads, so more highways are faster. And cities that have a grittier network, I've shown you like what gritty cities look like already. So cities that have grittier networks are also faster. And you see that the coefficient on GDP here declines when we add these measures of road characteristics. So this happens because richer cities also have more major roads, grittier networks, especially the United States. Um, now, I am getting to the last part of the project in the last five or 10 minutes. And this last part of the project is more preliminary. 
Uh, and here our methods are not fully refined, but I want to show it to, to you anyways. Uh, in this last part of the project, we want to understand whether the speed differences that I've been showing you, whether these differences in speed, especially between rich and poor countries, whether they translate into differences in accessibility. Accessibility is important because we know that a traveler doesn't care about speed in itself. A traveler cares about how long it takes to go somewhere. And so we're going to think about accessibility as specific to a category like a restaurant or a police station. So accessibility to restaurant depends on two things, depends on how close you live to the restaurant, so travel distance, and it depends on how fast you can get there. So it's interesting because rich cities in the United States have very rapid travel, but if destinations are very far from where people live because of low urban densities, then these speed differences may not be very meaningful in the sense that they don't translate into better accessibility. So now we define this simple possible measure of accessibility as travel time to the closest destination. Specifically, we use one over travel time as our accessibility index because short travel times are better and we want that index to go up when accessibility is good. So we define distance here as distance to the closest destination in a given category, so say the closest restaurant from a point I in a city C. So now accessibility at that point is equal to speed divided by distance. So again, accessibility to say restaurants depends on how close restaurants are from you and how fast you can get there. So before showing you another graph of GDP versus accessibility. Let me describe some results in words. So we estimate our accessibility index in four different categories. So schools, community and religion, restaurants, and personal care. And here I report an average for the four, but these averages that I report hide substantial differences across categories. So for instance, poor cities have better accessibility to community and religion, and rich cities have better accessibility to restaurants. Overall, we find that across cities, uncongested speed is positively correlated with accessibility. So cities with good infrastructure also have good accessibility. So in other words, we don't find evidence for the story I suggested earlier, where perhaps in the United States, there's very fast travel, but bad accessibility because every destination is far uh, from where people live. We don't find evidence for, for that story. Uh, next, we ask whether rich countries have better accessibility. We already know that richer countries have faster travel. So now we want to look, do richer countries also have shorter or longer travel distances to establishments? So here, I'm showing you the relationship between, again, GDP of country and the average distance to the closest establishment in these countries. And we see that it's not a strong relationship between distance to closest establishment and GDP per capita. So very poor countries like Mozambique, Afghanistan, Ethiopia have long distances. And very rich countries like Switzerland and United Arab Emirates, the Netherlands, have fairly short distances to establishments. But there's a lot of variation in the middle. Uh, and in fact, the countries with the shortest distances, so the countries where people live the closest, to destinations, the closest to schools, restaurants, and so on. They're middle income countries like Indonesia, Brazil, Kenya, India um, have the shortest distances to establishments. And the longest distances are often in countries in Central Asia, like Uzbekistan, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan. But here it's subject to further data quality check 
we worry it could be an issue with with uh, with the Google Play data. So we, we want to verify that. Finally, I'm showing you accessibility versus GDP per capita. So I've shown you the link between GDP and speed, GDP and distance, and putting it together, we can look at the link between GDP and accessibility that I'm showing here. And here we see a much clearer relationship between accessibility and GDP. Um, so again, accessibility depends on travel distance and travel speed. So the only difference between that plot here and that plot there is travel speed. Um, so clearly, richer countries have better accessibility because they are faster, not because they have closer distances to establishments. Um, so to summarize those results before concluding, so we find that the GDP of a country, so how rich a country is, it's highly correlated with uncongested speed. So in other words, richer countries have much better road infrastructure. Um, the GDP of a country is only modestly correlated with having more congestion and with having shorter distances to destinations. So this suggests that richer countries have better accessibility, mostly due to better road infrastructure. And in fact, when we compare travel time to the closest establishment in middle income countries to that in rich countries, we find it takes 50 to 100% longer to accomplish the same trip purpose. So comparing rich and poor countries, you get even larger differences in how long it takes to get anywhere by motor vehicle. Uh, and as we keep working on this project, we want to do more data quality checks. We want to verify these results. And we also want to think about trips that are by foot, so walking, and by public transit. So let me conclude here. Um, we developed an urban transportation database that's comparable across ward cities using a methodology that's unified and transparent. And we really hope that this kind of data and methodology can be useful to policymakers and, and researchers in, in different countries. We've already used that data here to establish two important results. So first, we've shown that good road infrastructure may be more important than congestion um, and, then, and more important than distance to establishment in determining accessibility. And second, we found that richer countries have much better road infrastructure. I mean, that's unsurprising, but we show that this better infrastructure also translates into much better speed and much better accessibility outcomes. Um, we're not aware of many studies that compare infrastructure across countries. Uh, and we think it's highly relevant and important that it takes twice as much time to cover the same distance in a poor country relative to a rich country. And this is not because of congestion. So again, so this work is preliminary. We're still actively working in that research agenda. Uh, we have data on public transit and on the location of transit station that we'd like to explore as well. There's still a lot more work that we need to do to understand the determinants of accessibility in cities. Uh, in particular, we want to think about how accessibility varies with the size of cities. Uh, so they're all part of that research agenda that we're excited to work on uh, in the future. So I will stop here. I will thank you all and thank again the organizer for, uh, I'll thank you for attending the talk, the, the organizer for making it possible. And I, I look forward to your feedback and to answering your questions. Thank you. Okay, that was the end of the lecture. Uh, if you have any additional questions, please send them to me. And I already have a few selected, but there's always room for more. Uh, so our first question is, um, how exactly can your findings influence policymakers? Uh, excuse me, can you repeat, please? Uh, yes. Um, our first question is, uh, how, can, how exactly can your findings influence policymakers? Yes, so one of our most policy relevant finding is that 
the reason many cities are slow is not because of traffic congestion. It's because they have bad infrastructure. So from the perspective of an urban policymaker, it provides at least some guidance about the type of policies that could be effective. If your city is slow in the middle of the night, congestion fighting policy that like congestion, uh, congestion pricing or HOV lanes, they're not gonna be helpful. Reducing the number of cars on the road is not gonna be helpful because the city is slow even with no traffic. So it provides some guidance to policymakers that way. Uh, the second question is that we got was, um, how does the speed of traffic affect average people in a city? Well, it's, I don't know how many of you uh, own a car. I had my first car at 16, but I think now people have cars later, but it just takes longer to go places when travel is slow. You want to go meet your friend, you want to go to a restaurant, you want to commute to work, you want to drive to school, it takes more time and your time is valuable. So when we try, I'm an economist by training. So when we try to answer a question like that, we take a measure of how people value their time, which is generally related to their wages. So in the US, something like people value their time, say at $15 per hour. And then if travel is slow and it takes more time to go places, we can find the benefit of faster speed by computing the time that people would save if they could travel faster. And if you think during the pandemic, why did people like working from home? Because they didn't have to commute, they were saving time. But an alternative would be just faster commute to work. I'll stop here, but I could go on on that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and we have one more question, which is, uh, what affects the other half of speed and accessibility variation in cities? I'm very sorry. Can you please, uh, can you please repeat? Yeah, of course. Um, the question was, what affects the other half of speed and accessibility variation in cities? Ah, I see. So um, here, yes. So with the controls that we have, say, just for speed, we explain about 62%. Um, here it could be it's everyone's guess right we'll never be able to explain a hundred percent of the variation because there's measurement error in the data all of this is measured imprecisely so there's always some variation in speed some variation in these measures that is random so you'll never get to a hundred what are the other factors that could be important I imagine there's many other features of the road network that we're not able to measure well. For instance, like the quality of the paving of the road. Are there multiple uses? Like, are there people setting shops on the roadsides? Are there like pedestrians on the roads? Um, are there lots of intersections everywhere, which that we could measure? So there's a lot of other characteristics of road networks, some that are harder to measure that are not in there and probably matters. But if you have ideas for what could explain this variation, put them in the chat and we'll be interested. We can even test them if we can find the data. Um, I just have one final question for like just general people, but if somebody's interested in this type of field, how would you suggest them to like, like what activities or yeah, what activities would you suggest them to like do in high school and college if they were interested in this field? Well, I mean, I, I can talk about the path that I took. Um, it's so to do that kind of research, 
is generally done by people that have a PhD. I have a PhD in economics. So this is academic research. If you want to do research at that level of detail, it's generally done in a university by academics. So you're still in high school. So you do an undergraduate degree in whatever interests you. <laughs> and then towards the end of your undergraduate degree, you, you start thinking about graduate school, about doing a PhD. Um, because to be an academic, to work in a university, to do that kind of research, you need to do um, a PhD. Uh, this is not something that you need to worry about in your first year of <laughs> university, but in the second and third year, it's good to start introducing yourselves to your professors who are doing that kind of research because the way to get in a good PhD program is to get letters and recommendations from these people. But that you have plenty of time to, to figure that out. But if you want already to start thinking about doing that kind of research, think about yourself as staying in university for a long time doing a PhD and then taking a job as a professor in a university. I mean, I'm a professor, I think it's a beautiful job. Like a, teaching is a privilege. Like, I mean, what I'm doing here is I'm obviously privileged to be doing this, like to have people listening to me talk. That's, that, that's always a, a privilege and being able to do the research I'm interested in. No one is suggesting that I do that research or telling me to do it. I find it interesting and important. And I chose people I like working with and I do this project that's called academic freedom. Um, so yeah, so it's a great job. It's a great career path. Um, you need a PhD and then you find an academic job.